Hello, my name is Tom Stone, and I am ThermalCare's National Sales Manager for Industrial Markets. In part number one of this webinar series, we reviewed the individual process cooling system components, and now, in part two, we will bring these items together to create a complete free cooling system solution. So now that we know a little bit about the major components that we would look at, we'll want to talk more about a free cooling design. And there's a couple different types of free cooling designs. I'm going to focus a little bit on this first style and maybe a, a slight variation of that. Um, one of the reasons for that is this is one of the most effective designs because it has some great benefits that once you get past that first point of using the free cooling, how can I actually make it better? And so what this actually does is it works very well to do that. So what it does is we have that fluid cooler, which would be, in this case, it could be a traditional dry one or it could be the adiabatic style. And what we actually do is we put that in series with that air-cooled chiller. So now, in the coldest months of the year, we can actually send that water that's hot and has come back from the process before it would actually go to the chiller to be cooled. We can actually send it through this uh, fluid cooler or the free cooler in this case. And so what that does is it actually takes that load out first before the water then goes to the chiller. And so we've actually removed some of the heat out of the system before the chiller even sees it. And so that allows the chiller to react accordingly and either turn off completely or consume less energy, which is part of load shedding, which we'll go into a little more detail about here shortly. Um, one of the things to consider with this is just like when you have that packaged air-cooled chiller sitting outside, you are now sending that water outdoors. And so there exists a scenario where that water could potentially be trapped outside in the winter and could freeze. So uh, this type of system design does require a glycol mixture. To address that, we would use something that would have a heat exchanger. And so this is a very similar setup to that previous slide, but what we've done is we've added a heat exchanger to isolate a 100% pure water loop from a glycol mixture loop. And so that way, we can still run those pieces of equipment that are sitting outside and exposed to the ambient condition, but then we don't have to worry about the glycol inside of the facility going into the machines and things like that. One of the key things to note here is that in that pump tank depicted there with the, the red and lines and the, the light blue and then the orange all going into it there, that's a fully divided tank. And so what that means is it's no longer that thermal divider like we discussed at the very beginning about central chiller systems. This is a fully divided tank. So the tank on the left side and the, the tank on the right side are the two wells. They are completely separated from one another because one is 100% water and the other has a glycol mixture. So what that allows is you can actually use one large tank with two independent wells in it. And so that way it reduces the footprint of the equipment. It reduces the actual cost uh, for purchasing because you don't have to buy two separate tanks. So what we're going to look at here is this is a graph and this is just a, you know, a, an example. And what we're actually showing here is based upon the dry bulb temperature, how often this unit can achieve its desired set point. And in this case, the desired set point would be about 65 degrees, I believe. And so what we're looking at here is say if we have a system that whenever the unit is exposed to 50 degree ambient air, it can achieve 50% of the year to maintain its temperature. So what we're saying there is that if our chiller system is looking to produce, say, 60 some odd degrees temperature, when that ambient air temperature is at 50, we can completely shut off that chiller and replace it with this free cooler. So, to kind of show the difference here, we'll look at now as that temperature increases outside, what we're actually doing is we're able to look at how our unit can replace more of the year running. So what we're actually saying is that this chiller, if we adjust its set point and we raise that set point and what's desired for the system to operate at ultimately, that's going to give us more hours per year. 
So if we look at this, basically what we're showing here is that we're increasing our number of hours per year that we can shut the chiller off. And the whole point of shutting that chiller off is because it's the major point of consumption of electrical energy. The fluid cooler that would sit outside to uh, supplement this as the free cooler, it uses a significantly less amount of energy. So what we're seeing here is that based on these two points, we've actually increased our ability to eliminate the chiller usage. And so what that allows us to do is to adjust how our system's going to operate. We actually gain about 30% more time of the year where we can completely turn off that chiller. And so what we've done is we have actually adjusted that set point of our system and then we've gained hours of operation where the chiller is off. That 30% is a huge portion of the year because as you know, running a chiller is going to be expensive and if you can leave that off, that's gonna save money and ultimately the investment to design this free cooling system is going to pay back for itself because we're able to increase these hours of operation. So earlier I had mentioned what we would call load shedding. And so with load shedding, we'll look at a system that's designed around a certain temperature to provide that. And what we're actually gonna say here is that we maintain our same set point, but what we've done is we've implemented the free cooler in series with the chiller. And because it's in series, that free cooler experiences the hot water first. And that's the key part because what we can do is we don't go either or with either the fluid cooler or the chiller. We can do both at the same time. And what that allows is what's called load shedding. And because of that, we can get an extended period of time per year because we're actually not going to 100% replace the chiller, but we'll allow it to operate at 75% or 50% or 25% of its capacity. And so as that decreases, it reduces its energy consumption. And so if we look here at this graph, basically what this is showing is that without changing anything, but other than having that free cooler in series, we actually gain an additional percentage of the year where we may not be completely replacing that chiller, but we can actually remove some of the load and therefore reduce some of the consumption of that chiller. So there's two aspects to this free cooling. It's the 100% replacement, and then also we have the, the load shedding, which kind of shares that demand with the chiller and allows it to shut off part of its demand, greatly reducing its energy consumption. So finally, what I want to bring up here is just some alternative designs that can be used um, with this, this looks like a, a very complicated system, but ultimately it's a, it's a pretty elegant solution. And what this does is it allows you to, one, utilize a water-cooled chiller that will then have the condenser cooling from, in this case, an adiabatic fluid cooler. But what we actually will do is we will allow that adiabatic fluid cooler temperature to drive down during low ambient conditions, so during the winter months. What that does is it has two impacts. One, with colder condenser water going to that chiller, that chiller is actually able to optimize and reduce its energy consumption just by the fact that it's receiving cooler condenser water. Then when that condenser water is then cold enough, we can actually completely switch over and there are some valves depicted in these, uh, this piping diagram here that would basically bypass the chiller completely and go to a heat exchanger, like we had discussed earlier with that isolation of the glycol versus the chiller system. It's a very similar concept here, uh, but what we're doing now is we're combining that with the use of a water-cooled chiller, and with that water-cooled chiller, we get the increased energy efficiency, but then we've also layered in the free cooling design as well. So those are some of the things that are the major impacts of considering going with a free cooling design. So you want to understand what type of chiller you're going to need, what type of um, high temperature cooling, whether it be an adiabatic unit or a cooling tower, and then what sort of limitations you have on the type of fluid that you send to your process. So can you have a glycol mixture? Can you not? 
Do we need to use that isolation? And then do we want to look at a scenario where that free cooler is in series with the chiller or is it just going to be a 100% replacement or off? So those are some of the items to consider when you're looking at a, a central cooling system. Uh, but these units and the designs of these, especially in the cooler climates, will prove to be uh, very quickly to pay back uh, for that capital cost investment. Thank you for listening, and I hope you learned something. Thank you.